Yeah, I'm going to kill you one of these days. Um, so uh, we are back on Fertility Factor Fiction and uh, welcome back everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us on whatever platform you're watching on. We um, broadcast to TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, YouTube. You, I said YouTube, didn't I? Facebook, Instagram, yeah, Twitter, there's five. TikTok. Five, right? Yep. Yeah. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we normally have topics to review, but uh, I was sick this week. So this week we are going to go straight to questions for you, maybe even finish up a bit early. Um, I have to fast at this time of year, so um, I probably uh, am not in the strongest of shape at the moment, but happy to uh, attempt to answer your Still questions. Great sound, right? Oh, you're the best. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. Um, I hope you guys are all doing well. Um, for those of you that are relatively local, I have absolutely no idea what's going on with our psychotic weather. One minute it's warm, the next minute it's snowing, the next minute it's a ice storm. It's being completely bonkers here. Um, and for those of you uh, in other parts of the world, or uh, at least in North America, I hope everything is going well for you. Um, for all of our American patients, thank you for watching and thank you for reaching out. Um, I got a whole bunch of uh, uh, reports from patients this week that they followed our protocol and got pregnant. So that was super exciting to hear. Um, so I think we had a whole bunch of questions already and um, you got those already or you I don't? I do one from earlier today. Okay, earlier today. Earlier today. All right. Hello, darling doctors. Oh, darling, darling doctors. <laughs> this deserves to be answered. This meets all criteria of a great question. <laughs> yeah, that was a slam dunk for Tarek. Um, if you ever needed to get his attention, just call him Dr. T. Uh, um, I saw the whole... Uh, non-medical. Yeah, non-medical. That was hilarious. Yeah, <laughs> very well done. Anyways, uh, far away. Uh, first IVF was a flop. Oh, okay. sorry. I'm okay. 38 years old. AFC 11, AMH 0.82, nine eggs retrieved, eight mature, four fertilized, only one made it to blast. Oh. Low level trisomy 20, meds were seven days birth control, gonal F 300, Medicare 150, antagonist and HCG trigger. What should we do differently the next cycle? Um, okay, so uh, you got to put that disclaimer there, across the there. bottom. It's yeah, so it's I always there, by the way. I, I got to be careful. We're not allowed to give patient specific information, but I can review topics with you. So I'll take some of the highlights from that. I should probably start taking notes, you know. Um, okay, so uh, the first issue is should birth control be used for patients before they start a cycle? And the answer is the data on birth control prior to a cycle. Um, largely seems to favor not using birth control prior to a cycle. Now, I'm not going to say every single study shows the same thing because they don't. They've done meta-analyses of these, of this topic, and it has overall shown that it is detrimental to use birth control pills prior to an IVF cycle. So for anyone out there going into an IVF cycle, unless there's something very, very wrong, um, you should, generally speaking, avoid using birth control pill prior to a cycle because it will reduce the number of eggs that you produce and suppress you, relatively speaking. So we certainly don't do that. Um, the other question is, uh, what should uh, medication dosages be when you're going into an IVF cycle? So um, we try very hard to avoid high doses. So 450 is a high dose. We've kind of capped our doses at around 375. I do occasionally go to 450. In fact, I had to today for two patients, but only if they're failing on the 375. We try to start lower because there are studies that indicate that the uh, higher the dose of the medication, the more damage to the um, cytoskeletal structure of an egg and if you're damaging the cytoskeletal structure of an egg, you're going to have a hell of a time when it's trying to divide. So we don't want to do any damage. So we generally keep our hormone levels or, or our, um, our FSHLH levels pretty low when we are stimulating our patients. We try not to go high. I'm not a big fan of mini stim. So I'm not talking about mini stim, but we also don't do high dose stim because it doesn't seem to be productive. 
With regards to the ratio, there is a British study that has shown that the optimal ratio of urinary, manipure, to recombinant, go on the left, is 50-50. It's actually 55-45, but no one can achieve that, so we all just do 50-50. So that's the best ratio to achieve the highest number of genetically normal embryos. So we've done 50-50 probably for the last, I don't know, 10 years now since I read that study. Uh, maybe a little bit less than that. So um, that's kind of the things that we look at when we're going into any IVF cycle. Again, I can't kind of address yours specifically, but hopefully I answered the question that you're asking. Um, so yeah, I mean, birth control pill is something we avoid. We try to use lower doses. Um, letrozole has been shown to improve outcomes in patients that are doing um, IVF who are older or have uh, diminished ovarian reserve. I guess the big question I'd have to ask you is to let us know why you only had 50% um, of the eggs fertilized. That doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, that happens extraordinarily rarely um, to us. And so I'd be wondering why that happened. And I want to know, is it a sperm issue, an egg issue? What are your other you know, lifestyle factors? And certainly if you do want one-on-one -on -one information, just email us at info at drvictory.com and we will reach out. And once you're a patient, I can give you any personal information you want, but you actually have to be a patient for me to answer one-to-one -one questions or give medical advice. Although nothing here is medical advice. I'm just talking data. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Reviewing studies. So um, a question <clears throat> of great importance Okay. that you will have no problem answering. Okay. Uh, what are you going to eat to break your fast? Oh, well, my dear friend Tarek here uh, brought us um, Lebanese food from a place called Kebabji, which is like great Lebanese food in Windsor. So we, I had chicken, which is shish tawuk. He had the mixed one, which is beef and chicken. Um, it came on some rice and veggies. And then we had uh, baba ganoush and hummus and some fetouche salad. Did you have fetouche also? I didn't pay attention. We both had fetouche salad. And then we went for their awe-inspiring baklava, but it wasn't awe-inspiring <laughs> tonight. This time. This, <laughs> this time. time. But normally it's awe-inspiring and we love it. So um, if you're local and you haven't tried kebabji, and I have no promotional interest with them, um, the food's phenomenal. It's the best Lebanese. I've had. I went, you're Middle Eastern yeah, too. It's good. It's what, good. Do you know of anywhere better here? For, for that? Yeah. No. No. Not, not, not I think they're the place. best. Yeah. Sit down and play games. Yeah, they're amazing. I love them. And they're really nice people, too. They're nice people. I give them that. Yeah. Hey, Doc, and hey, T. Hey, Doc, and hey, T. All right. Thanks for being so genuine, always. Can you tell me, <laughs> how is a clinic successfully calculated? It boggles my mind when I think of all the variables to consider. Uh, what are your success rates in endo patients? Uh, okay. So first, I'm going to answer a quick TikTok question from Steve. Uh, yes, I am from Windsor. Um, so, uh, yeah, clinic rates are calculated differently, um, depending on what they're presenting to you. So, and this is kind of infamous throughout the fertility world. So you can talk about rates per transfer, or you can talk about rates per cycle. You can talk about, um, positive betas. You can talk about positive heart rates, or you can talk about live births. Um, so, and then you can break down by age or talk about overall, are you including your donor population, which does wildly better than everybody else. So it's kind of hard to pin down, um, one isolated number. You can ask the clinic for their numbers, but, um, you know, it, it is different from each one. Um, so again, I can't tell you what our numbers for endo patients are because it depends on so many factors. I got to know what the sperm's like. I got to know what your body mass index is like. I got to know what your social habits are. I got to know how bad your endo is. Um, I got to know what you've done before. Uh, what were the outcomes from that? But I can tell you that we have probably the best endo protocol out there, in my opinion. And I think it works very, very well because we account for the medical part of things, we approach the natural part of things with supplements. I do the surgical part of things myself, um, where and when necessary. We totally believe in suppression. So yeah, I mean, we follow it very, very closely to make sure that we are doing all the right things and we're doing it properly. Remedy mm -hmm. for low 
sperm count and sperm motility. Watch our YouTube video. We have, it's our second highest ranked video now, 95,000 yeah, views, 94, 95,000 views. So um, it says how to improve men's sperm. It's in the men's section on our YouTube channel. Um, ways to improve men's sperm. So uh, we talked about it on the video. I'm repeating what's on the video. Um, you can uh, ejaculate frequently. We know that that increases sperm. You can use vitamins. Um, some of them have been proven to benefit sperm quality. Uh, cold therapy, so we tell the guys to sit on frozen peas. And then probably most important, no smoking, no drinking, no drugs. And people always say, yeah, I'm gonna cut down. I don't mean cut down, I mean zero. Like stop smoking, stop doing drugs, stop drinking, all that stuff. And vaping is bad. So don't think that you're substituting it for vaping. It, it's not any better. What are your thoughts? <clears throat> on PRP before embryo transfers had no implantation last time on embryo transfers? So we've got um, YouTube videos on that as well. Uh, there are studies on um, PRP. So reviewing those studies demonstrates that there is a significant improvement in outcomes for patients who do PRP prior to embryo transfer. Um, so it can improve it if you've had unexplained failures and it can also improve it if your lining is thin. So those are the functions of PRP. Um, we've started doing it. Uh, I don't think I've got enough numbers yet to be able to tell you categorically that it looks like it's working, but we do use it. PRP, for those of you that don't know, like Steve on TikTok, is platelet-rich plasma. So we draw your blood, uh, we put it through a, central, a special centrifugation process. It fractionates out the segment that has platelets in it those platelets have lots of cytokines and nutrients and um, things that can kind of rejuvenate tissues. And then you flush that into the uterus. Can you discuss subchronic hemorrhage and hematoma? Is it common and why does it happen? Um, so a subchorionic hemorrhage is a bleed between the sac that the baby is in and the wall of the uterus. So the baby's in a sac, it's called the amnion and the chorion, and um, there's two layers to it, and that is stuck up against the uterus. So if you get blood in that space between the two, it'll kind of bubble out and you'll get a collection of blood in the space between the uterus and the sac on this side. That blood can then track between that space and come out your cervix and it can present with bleeding. So the question is, why does it happen? So most common would be smoking, drug use, trauma. High blood pressure can do it. Um, if you're on blood thinners, it can do it too. Um, it's pretty rare with aspirin, but it's a possibility. Um, how do you diagnose it? It can be seen on ultrasound if it's big enough. Um, sometimes if they're small, you can't see them at all. And then what do you do about it? No one knows. So no one's ever been able to prove that anything helps once you have a subchorionic hemorrhage. In, intuitively, I guess, we all, or instinctively, we all tell patients, don't um, you know, try to uh, do a lot of heavy work, heavy lifting, straining, maybe pelvic rest so there's nothing going in and out of the vagina, but we don't know. Uh, hello, I'm new here. Hi, I'm back 2023. And uh, we're from Ontario, Canada, too, so hello. Um, yeah, so uh, subchorionic hemorrhage, the big issue is how common is it? It's pretty common. Um, there's a substantial number of women that will bleed in pregnancy. Um, and the question is how many of them will go on to lose the pregnancy? Very, very few, thankfully. Um, but even as high as 25% in some studies have been shown to have bleeding in the first trimester. The outcome of that is rarely a miscarriage, so that's good. <clears throat> I got a TikTok one. Go for it. Uh, I'm gonna rephrase it, Manda. So what is the benefit of an HCG wash for an FET? Uh, so HCG wash prior to an FET has been demonstrated in studies to demonstrate up to a 30% increase in implantation. Do I recommend it for everybody? I don't, because not everybody needs it. And so we don't do it unless we've had failures, but you certainly could. Um, it just takes a lot more time and it's more involved and there's a slight increase in the cost, um, but we do it after the, the first failure. So if we've failed the first time, I'll offer it to all of our patients for sure. Yeah, 
you want 500 units and we just inject it into the uterus 15 minutes before. It's interesting because a patient the other day said um, that it should be done a day before because that's what their doctor said. And um, the reality is there's only one meta-analysis I'm aware of on this topic. And that says that you should do it 15 minutes before because that was the optimal time. So I don't know where the doctor that said one uh, day before got it from, but um, if you're gonna do it differently, it actually makes sense to do it several days before because the embryo probably lands in the uterus when it's a day three embryo. And at that point, it's sort of secreting HCG already. So that probably makes the most sense for doing anything. Um, but the studies showed that the best time is 15 minutes. So we do 15 minutes. You Hopefully that was helpful. Hi, Dr. Victory from Rhonda. Hi, Rhonda. You ready for this? I'm always ready. I'm never ready, actually. I've got to think it through every time. <laughs> Would love to hear your thoughts okay. on birth control as a treatment for slowing down endometriosis. Oh, well, that's not a bad one. Um, so there are multiple treatments that are available for endometriosis. Birth control actually is not an unreasonable one. It's pretty decent at quelling the pain and the relatively higher dose of progesterone compared to estrogen is beneficial in doing a little bit of suppression for the endometriosis. So um, there are loads of studies on using the birth control pill. It's decent for pain. It's probably not going to stop growth and development of the endo, but it might slow it down enough to make it worthwhile to use. With regards to um, uh, other options, there are things like Vizan, um, which is available in Canada, but apparently it's not available in the States. I don't understand that. So Vizan is a special type of progesterone. It's one of the main birth control ingredients in Europe, but here they isolated it just to be progesterone. And it works very, very well on um, endometriosis. In fact, in head-to-head -head studies against Lupron, it was almost as effective. So we use Vizan. You can use Oralissa, um, which is a GnRH ag uh, antagonist. Um, that works very well too. You do have to add in some estrogen or progesterone, uh, kind of at hormone replacement therapy levels in order to um, allow it to not over-suppress you and cause bone loss and stuff like that, but it does work well. And then kind of the holy grail is Lupron. Um, Lupron with add back is quite good and effective. Um, I always now put out that disclaimer because I got flamed by people one time. Um, there are people out there that believe that Lupron is the devil and the side effects are horrible and it should be avoided and um, that the company is evil and all this stuff. I don't believe that that's true. We've used it without harm in literally thousands of women. Um, but there are people out there that desperately believe that it has had the worst of worst outcomes for them. So you got to be cautious. Um, we had someone ask about metformin and uh, PCOS. So uh, I'll talk about PCOS in general. <laughs> this is the new format of this show. So silly. Um, okay, so PCOS, in my opinion, uh, should have three different approaches to it. So uh, we talked about the medical approach. So the medical approach is letrozole, which is the first line agent for women who are irregular with their cycles in PCO. Um, and that helps you to become regular in about 93 to 97% of cases, depending on what study you read. And then depending on whether or not you have insulin resistance, if you are insulin resistant, metformin is very helpful for fighting that insulin resistance. And there are studies that show that the letrozole with the metformin is better than the metformin or the letrozole alone. So they're, they're quite synergistic. You can use them together. So that's very helpful. For patients um, that want to take the next step, um, we also recommend a natural approach. So natural approach, the supplements uh, that we support are coenzyme Q10, inositol, NAC, NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, and resveratrol. Now, all of these have multiple little studies that have shown benefits, so that's why I support their use. And they're natural and they're generally harmless, so they're safe to use in most patients. But again, always discuss everything with your physician before trying anything at all, including the natural supplements, please. So make sure you're discussing with your doctor and make sure they're knowledgeable about these things. And if they're not, seek the advice of a physician who can help you in regards to those specific issues. The third part 
which is probably the most important part, but they're all important, so I, I tell all my patients to do all three, is maintaining a healthy, balanced diet and exercise. So healthy, balanced diet for someone with PCO, probably somewhere around 1,500 calories per day, 1,300 if you've got weight as an issue, 1,500 if weight's not a huge issue. Um, and that needs to be broken up across six um, uh, meals per day. So breakfast, snack, lunch, snack, dinner, snack. Exercise is really critical. So people always tell me they're walking. Listen, um, I love you guys for putting in the effort, but walking is useless for people with PCO. It literally won't do anything. So you need to build muscle. The more muscle you build, the more calories you require to maintain your muscle. So what you're taking in gets used for maintenance and then there's less to store. When there's less to store and your body needs more energy, it burns its stores, which is fat. First glycogen in your liver and then fat. So once you burn through your glycogen, your body will start turning to the fat supply. And what we wanna do for many of our PCO patients is get them leaner. So the best way to get leaner is to build more muscle. So that's what we're trying to do. Hi, my favorite doctor is TMD. Doctors, see, they're just yeah. sucking up to you now. They know the secrets. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a lot of heart emojis. A lot which, of heart emojis. Which always gets me. Yeah. I got pregnant after multiple IVFs. Okay. Now 29 weeks. Oh, great. Three hour glucose is high. Oh. How dangerous is gestational diabetes? Can I just ignore sticking fingers and medications? Ah. Uh. Gestational diabetes can be serious, less so for you and much more so for your baby. So we, any obstetrician you see will take gestational diabetes seriously. Any endocrinologic, um, uh, you know, uh, service or recommendation or guideline that you see will tell you that you should um, definitely seek assistance and advice and help. So we take that stuff very seriously. I would not, I, I would, never tell any of my patients to ignore their gestational diabetes. That would, in my mind, be negligent, medically speaking. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not sure about what this question is asking, but I'll leave that up to you. I will do this my best. This is when you become doctor and I become the Atlantic Coral. This is, this is, this is the moment. Okay. How E. coli in semen fluid culture impacts IVF outcomes or fertility in general? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we don't know. Uh, it's interesting. Fertilisis can actually detect bacteria in the sperm, let alone in your seminal fluid. I mean, if it's in your seminal fluid, that's probably not great because some of that's getting into the uterus and depositing E. coli in the uterus is almost certainly bad for the microbiome in the uterus. Um, in fact, I don't think I've ever seen an E. coli infection in the uterus, but, um, that, would certainly not be a great idea by any means for anyone to attempt or, or to have. Um, but as far as the infections in the sperm are concerned, I actually tried to look it up because I was quite interested that Fertilisys had developed this test. I could not find any studies. If any of you out there have found any, um, raise your hand or uh, throw up a comment and I'd be happy to look at the study because I could not find any and I, I did quite a bit of searching. So I think they were, it was a new technique they developed and and no one could figure it out yeah so interesting but i'm not aware of anything so i want to ask this question <clears throat> even though it doesn't properly address oh even though it doesn't yeah. properly address yeah. you yeah. all right i feel you hi dr b and Tarek. i just got completely demoted can i take <laughs> here i'm having fun here <laughs> Can I take ALA in all my pregnancies? Lots of studies say it prevents and treats subchronic hematoma and increases cervix length. ALA? Yeah. I have no idea what ALA is. Uh, Shall I look it up? Uh, sure. ALA in pregnancy? Yeah. Alanine? The, the amino acid? That's the only thing I can think of. Uh, I can probably... Oh, I can't look it up yeah, here, can yeah, I? That's why. Is Very this like, uh, I don't know if it's charged, but I can check. ALA pregnancy. Uh, a lipoic acid. 
Oh, alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid. Yeah, there's not a lot of evidence for the value of alpha lipoic acid. So um, uh, I, I certainly haven't seen anything talking about extending cervical length, and I've never seen anything about subchorionic hemorrhage. I'll be happy to look it up. We'll go to the, fir the first thing I typed in was from the NCVIL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, what does it, it say? It has been proven to be effective in maintaining the length of the cervix and keeping it closed following one episode of premature labor. Alpha lipoic acid? Yeah, um, even, they underlined it. Google knew. Now, we, we may be, have to scrutinize the study. I, I got to look that up. I don't know that that's true. Alpha lipoic acid. And pregnancy. And pregnancy. I'll probably bring up 5,000. Uh, um, well, it worked in rats. Oh, well, this might be the topic for next, uh, next week. Is it a fact or a fiction? It could be a fact or a fiction. I don't know. Um, this could be cool. Let's check this out, guys. I'll bring this up next week. This will be next week's topic. Thank you, whoever that was. Um, we got to start sending out t-shirts to people oh, that yeah. ask good questions, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, benefits of alpha lipoic acid in high-risk pregnancies. Oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to check this out. I was not aware of that kind of evidence for pregnancy. I've looked it up for fertility use. Um, I'll check it out and I'll let you know. That's the next week's show. Maybe we could do a whole video on alpha lipoic acid. Is this the next great thing? Is the next great thing? Yeah. Potentially. Can't just give it away. Uh, here's one. Lycopene and alpha lipoic acid <laughs> improve semen antioxidant enzymes activity and cashmere goat sperm function. <laughs> After cryopreservation. Cashmere and goat sperm. I can't make this stuff up. Who studies this? This is hilarious. Um, we're going to have to check this out. The goat sperm or the cashmere? No, I'm not doing goat sperm, man. <laughs> it's a whole other show. It's a whole other show. Yeah, this is cool. We're going to do a whole show on... We'll do a video on alpha lipoic acid. We'll do next show on alpha lipoic acid. Thank you. I don't know who you are because I can't see your name, but that's awesome and I appreciate it. Yeah. Dr. Green Tea, can I stick my arm or leg instead of finger picks for controlling gestational diabetes? Could gestational diabetes happen because of IBF? Um... Patients that get IVF are at higher risk of gestational diabetes. Uh, you need to talk to your doctor about where you can stick yourself for your needle. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Was it because of a hater? Hi or? there for everybody on TikTok who keeps saying hi there. Everyone yeah. wants to say hi to you. Yeah. Was it, so this question is, yeah. Was it because <laughs> of a hater or a lawyer that you are not allowed to continue being yourself? Question mark. It's so neither. I see that. Yeah, I know, guys. I'm sorry. It's neither. I received information indicating that um, we should not be directly giving advice to patients online unless they're patients. So you have to be my patient, and then I can answer anything you want. But I mean, we've got 3,000 people on here watching, so um, we can't just dole out personal health information. So happy to review topics. But I can't give like personal level stuff. But we're making it work by changing your questions into topics. So hopefully you're all still getting the same. Still a great thing. show. Still as a great far show. as I see, questions are being asked. Questions are being answered. Answered, yeah. That's what they, everyone's asking. Yeah. Um, is there real data behind Oralissa and Letrozole for endosuppression? Or is this data in progressor? progress? Oh, um, or Alyssa has data for endo. There's no question about that. Um, if you're asking in relation to, is there a data on or Alyssa use for endo patients leading up to an FET? Um, there probably is. I haven't specifically looked for it because I don't use or Alyssa for that purpose. 
Um, but there is de definitely data on Oralissa for endo. Those were the part of their original studies. So yeah, for sure that's there. Um, hi again to everybody from TikTok. As soon as they jump on on TikTok, they say hello. Hi, everybody. Uh, in terms of um, uh, letrozole, letrozole by itself for endo is probably useless. But letrozole in conjunction with Lupron, in one study that I really liked a lot, demonstrated a huge increase in success. So we use Lupron with letrozole together. So in theory, theory, if Lupron and letrozole work together, then there's no reason to believe that um, Oralissa and letrozole wouldn't also work together, although they do use different mechanisms, but the end result is the same, a lowering of your overall level of estrogen. So um, you could probably try that. Again, talk to your physician, but uh, I don't see why if one works, the other one wouldn't. Hi, Dr. Bean T. Have you ever seen the value in priming with progesterone in the luteal phase prior to an IVF stim cycle? Is priming necessary? What? Have you ever seen value? Yeah. In priming with progesterone in the luteal phase oh. prior to an IVF stim cycle? No, I haven't. They've tried estrogen priming. Um, I haven't done progesterone priming, but we don't do that. I haven't seen any value. I don't understand this question. You can't have a child with someone who is not compatible. All you get is a UTI. <laughs> I have no idea what that means. Um, somebody has to explain that to me. I have absolutely no idea what that means. Uh, let me know what that means. I believe they're stating a fact. I think they're probably just stating a fact. That's a very interesting <laughs> they're, point. They're educating us. Yeah. I think they're trying to say that don't have sex with someone that isn't actually socially or, yeah. or relationship compatible with you because otherwise you're just having sex and the only outcome of that is a UTI. Maybe they got a UTI. Yeah. Uh, after IUI during a two-week wait, are there any symptoms someone could look for? Actually, that's an interesting question. So I actually looked that up recently because I wanted to do a video on what are the actual symptoms of pregnancy that have been validated in terms of predictive value. And I actually could not find a study that demonstrates what the predictive value of any early pregnancy symptoms are. So for those of you that are wondering what early pregnancy symptoms are, um, so the most common ones would be urinary frequencies, so you're going to pee more often, nausea, fatigue, and breast tenderness. That's basically it. There really isn't a lot more than that um, early on. Um, so, and if it's really early, it's mostly just urinary frequency, maybe some nausea, occasionally, occasionally fatigue, but super early on, you don't even get that. So those are the main ones. Um, I can't tell you what the predictive value of those specific symptoms are because as much as I searched for it and I went back like 20 years, there, there was no study, but I think it'd be a great topic. I saw some of my colleagues online talking about it, but I was like, you know, let's give people some actual numbers. There are no numbers, so I actually can't tell you what, what the data shows. Yeah. Thank you, JP. Wondering <clears throat> why my first IUI they used the advanced watch. Had success first time at 31 years old. This time they did the standard watch at 35 years old. Wondering how they decide the one over the other. Uh, I don't know what an advanced versus a standard wash is. Um, we have different... Extra scrub. Extra scrub. I had no idea what this meant. I, <laughs> extra scrub. I thought poor Tark was having a seizure over there because he was going like this. Um, yeah, so uh, as far as I know, there are different prep techniques for sperm. So... Um, you can do a centrifugation, differential centrifugation. So you layer um, certain chemicals on top of one another and the sperm goes through it and um, the semen gets held up by the gradient and then the sperm ends up as a pellet at the bottom. Um, and then you got to rinse it and then re-spin it and whatever, resuspend it. So that's the most common technique. And then there's something called a swim-up technique where you can... Um, kind of put the sperm on one end of a channel and get them to run through the channel. Um, and the ones that kind of get there 
uh, the fastest are the best ones. So you kind of grab those before the rest of them try to make their way through. Um, and then there's the newer techniques, which are the micropore filters. So for example, the, the company Zymo is the only one I'm aware of that does it. And they have this um, device where you put the sperm on one end and they have to swim through a filter. And the filter is very good at getting rid of bad sperm. Um, the problem is it's almost too good and you get very little sperm on the other end, but it is a good product. Now the studies do not show a benefit to using it yet. Um, I've seen one study that did, the rest of them have not shown a benefit. So I need to kind of relook at that data again, but overall, um, those are the three techniques. Do any of them make a difference? I don't think anybody's shown that any of them are better than any other ones. So I think overall you can probably use whichever one you want. Dr. Victory, if a person stops the depot shot, what's the risk of getting a cycle at the age of 46? No way to answer that without knowing somebody's hormones. So we would need to know more about you and your hormones. Um, if you are not in menopause, in theory, you should get your cycle. The depot shot can stay in somebody's system for anywhere from up to 12 to 18 months um, at maximum. Um, so it's possible it could be delayed. In age 38, how long does it take to get pregnant? Wildly loaded question. Uh, um, yeah, it's not something anyone could answer because it's not age 38. It's what's your BMI? How often are you having sex? Are there any fertility problems? Have you been pregnant before? How many times have you been pregnant before? Have you had miscarriages? Do you have fibroids? Do you have polyps? Is there endo? Uh, what's your partner's sperm like? Do either of you smoke, drink? You, like, I can't answer a question like that. At age 38, there's no way to tell you how many times you're, uh, or how long it would take you to get pregnant. It's impossible. There's a, a billion factors that go into that. Hey, Dr. V, an awesome tea. Awesome tea, there you go. Yeah, I can take that. You're back. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Does your clinic use IMSI for IVF for male factors? No, we use ICSI. We don't use INSI. Um, it's never been shown to be beneficial. We ICSI everyone, but we don't INSI anybody. It's useless. Is the volume really low for everyone else, assuming you're not using headphones? Oh, I hope not. It seems like everybody can hear us. Can you guys throw up some hearts or thumbs or whatever if you can hear us okay? <clears throat> it might be my very growly voice. It might be. I, I raised up the volume. I don't know. But it's, it's, it's louder than usual at this point. Okay. All right. Um, Let us know if there's a problem. Oh, we got lots of hearts. Uh, Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, does elevating fasting glucose affect sperm quality? Yes. So guys that have um, high sugar, diabetes, high cholesterol even, have adverse impact on their sperm, for sure. Yeah. How to improve egg quality? I had two chemical pregnancies. Can it be due to poor egg quality? Um, I can't answer if it's due to poor egg quality or not. Obviously, you'd have to talk to your doctor. Um, in terms of ways to improve egg quality, so it's a really loaded question. Um, there's that great book called It All Starts With The Egg. So the problem with all of that stuff is it does all start with the egg, but it's really the genetics of the egg which are most important. Um, oh, people are saying on TikTok it was quieter. So um, maybe because it's got to go all the way out to the phone. On TikTok the volume's quieter? That's what they're saying. Probably because it's got to reach the phone, right? Because it's not going from here to there. Mm. Anyways. So, um, what were we talking about? You were talking about, um, I, I, I gotta re repeat the question. Yeah, read the question again. Uh, egg quality. Oh, egg quality, right, sorry. So, uh, egg quality is hugely important, but the problem is it's the genetics that are most important. So, um, the genetics of an egg are predetermined when you are born, right? So, while the eggs are being made in a woman's body, um, they're all already predetermined for their genetics. So yes, there are little subtle changes you can make to the egg quality in terms of uh, making sure the right vitamins are there and the right nutrients are there and stuff like that. But if it's genetically abnormal, you can pump it full of all the nutrients in the world. It's still genetically abnormal. 
So you can only make subtle changes to egg quality. And, and really the bigger question is, can we change egg genetics? And the answer is no, you can't. Um, so yeah, it's good to have healthy eggs. There's no question. And yes, of course, doing stuff that's detrimental to eggs, smoking, drinking, drug use is terrible for you. But we don't actually have solid proof yet that taking vitamins and supplements and stuff like that is helpful. I am in the process of getting a machine that will measure the amount of oxidative and reductive damage in eggs, uh, well, in follicular fluid, not in the egg, but in the follicular fluid. And we could then do a trial to see if women taking vitamins versus women not taking vitamins makes a difference in the oxidative and reductive damage. And then you'd have to correlate it with what the outcomes of their fertility treatment is, which would obviously have to be IVF for this model to work. So it is something we're looking at. Um, and other people are looking at that too, but I haven't received the machine yet. So we'll see soon. And we'll also be able to do it for sperm. It's a very cool thing because um, people always would ask us, can I take too many vitamins? And I would say, no, you can't really take too many vitamins. But apparently you actually can take too many vitamins. So uh, oxidative damage is when the free radicals in your body run around and do oxidative damage, um, ripping electrons off of other things, especially DNA, which can damage the DNA and that can compromise your egg quality, sperm quality, all of that stuff. Reductive damage is when you have too many vitamins and you're suppressing normal changeover. So the problem with that is that also may be damaging and they have done a study showing in men that if you have reductive damage, it's almost as bad as having the oxidative damage. So now we're figuring out that there may be a balance that is necessary rather than here, just take as many vitamins as possible. And, and listen, I, I appreciate the fact that everybody out there is doing their best. And loads of people are taking like buckets of buckets of vitamins and supplements and they're on stuff I've never even heard of half the time. But does it actually work? Um, we don't know. And can you overdo it? Yeah, you probably can overdo it. So be cautious. That's why I stopped taking vitamins. <laughs> no fruits, no vegetables, nothing. We got a good TikTok question. What are the risks of a hematoma in the first trimester? Um, miscarriage is the biggest risk. It's very small. The vast majority of people that have bleeding in the first trimester go on to have normal pregnancies. Generally speaking, it's less than 25% that will miscarry, but um, you got to be careful. So that's the main risk. It's miscarriage. Hi, Dr. V. Hi, Dr. T. Dr. T. Yeah, I'm, I'm fully in here today. Yeah. Yeah, you're going to need to add a disclaimer to our disclaimer yeah, yeah, that yeah. says, I, Tariq, am not a real doctor. Yeah, absolutely, I am not. Yeah. Um, oh, it's actually my favorite question. <laughs> Is it an error test question? Even better. Okay. Is there any research about red light therapy improving oh. egg quality? Uh, yeah, we don't know about red light therapy and egg quality. Red light therapy apparently does improve sperm. I'm trying to get the machine, the, the light here to see if it'll work. Um, I'm trying to convince my lab director. She's been reluctant so far, but I want to try it. But I'm not aware of anything that says it improves egg quality. Dr. V, can you discuss if a false LH surge could occur or does, or does testosterone suppress progesterone? Whoa. Uh, if you take enough testosterone, you'll suppress everything. So yes, you could suppress progesterone. Can you get a false LH surge? Um, you can have elevated LH levels persistently like PCOS women do. Um, I don't know what you mean by a false LH surge. Like generally speaking, there are no false LH surges. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure what that exactly is. Um, you can get elevated LH levels. You can have an LH surge. And if you have an LH surge, in theory, you should be releasing your egg. Um, can eggs be sticky enough to not release? Yes, occasionally that can happen. But generally speaking, they, they release once the LH surge does occur. For those that have sort of constitutively elevated 
LH levels like PCOS women, um, it, it can show up on an ovulation kit as being positive like consistently, but you're not surging. You just have really high LH levels. What is the recommended treatment for RIF with normal embryos? It depends on the cause of your recurrent implantation failure. So the recommended treatment would be call us. Let's go through your history. Let's do the testing we need to do to figure out why you have recurrent implantation failure and then go ahead. If anyone just says here, I'm going to do this. They're not really targeting treatment and not targeting treatment, in my opinion, is doing a disservice to the patient because how do I know what I'm treating? Like, I, I literally have no clue. So you need to test. You need to know the patient's history. You need to figure out what went wrong. Um, you may need to know details about what went into making the embryos. Was there sperm DNA fragmentation? Was one or both of them smokers or drug users or, or whatever? So, um, you know, were vitamin levels adequate? Like there's all sorts of details we look at. So um, there's no super easy answer to that, but there, there are things we would look at for you, for sure. Here's a question you might not be able to answer truthfully. Oh. Very controversial. Okay. All right. Big controversy. Okay. Are you team Selena or team Haley? There's a social media, there's a drama on the internet. About it's Selena Haley. Gomez yeah, and, right. and Haley Bieber? Yeah, big drama. Um, I'm team, I don't give a damn. <laughs> I am way too busy taking care of people. Um, and dealing with the uh, trials and tribulations of having 46 employees now to worry about Haley Bieber, it's Bieber, right? Mm -hmm. Haley Bieber or Selena Gomez. That's right. Yeah. Uh, don't know anything about them. I like the odd Selena Gomez song. That's probably about as much as I can say. Yeah. Oh, wait. Um, hello, Dr. VNT. What cycle day does SIMS usually start for IVF? Um, it varies, but most centers will start on day two or day three. And there's another one. Uh, hi, Dr. VNT. I had uterine suspension surgery. Does this increase my chance for frozen embryo transfer? Um, so I rarely do that, but I did do one recently. In fact, I spoke to my patient about that today. Um, it depends on why they did it. Um, I had to do it because I literally couldn't get into her uterus. So that was imperative. Um, but it depends on why they did it for you and how they did it and so on. So I can't really answer that, but, um, in certain circumstances, it can certainly make it easier for your embryo transfer. Hi, Dr. V. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. No mention of me whatsoever. And that's just the intro. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Tarek is on fire over here. <laughs> Smoke coming out of his ears. It's ugly. I need to get a fire extinguisher. <laughs> and blast some dust out of it or something yeah if you can explain further if we have kr kir h l a c partner mismatch yeah is surrogacy an option for this thank you um yes yeah because it's not a problem with your embryo it's a problem with your embryo in your partner so um, KIR can be a problem. Now, apparently, according to my friends at Fertilisys, um, taking Nupigen can help. But when we calculated the dose in Canada, it was $9,000 for three months of treatment. So I'm very reluctant to tell anybody to do that. That seems to be bonkers. So um, I like protecting my patients' resources and funds. That would be a little mental to give them that much uh, medication. So yes, a surrogate is a viable option in those circumstances. And there's no reason why you couldn't do that as long as you can afford a surrogate, which is quite costly. In a natural FET, uh -huh. what are normal estrogen levels between ovulation and FET? Is it a problem if estrogen is on lower end, less than a thousand picograms? Per mil? Big grants. Yeah, no, we don't really need to worry about your estrogen levels when you're doing an FT. Um, we reviewed one study on the show a long time ago where they said there was a minimum threshold, but it was 100. So it was really low. Um, you don't need to worry too much about that. So no, as long as you've got reasonable stuff, you're fine.
good night to silence lovers. They said good night. No one's ever said goodbye before. <laughs> that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's not bad. We'll take there you that. go. What if you don't have PCOS but still have elevated blood sugar for some reason? Uh, well, there's lots of things that can cause elevated blood sugar. Obesity, diabetes without PCOS, um, uh, high cortisol levels can cause that. Taking a lot of sugar can cause that. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of things. So you don't necessarily just have to have PCOS to have high blood sugar. There's many things that can lead to it. Is metformin plus mito Q good for older women? Would it work like perferdones? A high Kelly, um, like what? Perferodone, perferodone. I don't know what that. I R F E R O D O N E. Perferodone. I've never heard of that. Um, yeah, I'm not aware of any evidence that supports the use of metformin in older women. Um, MitoQ is probably helpful, but um, I've never seen anything that says older women should use metformin. I just completed my first egg retrieval and was disappointed to find out my fertilization rate was only 40%. Oh. I was expecting 70%. Sperm was normal and I used Dymo. Why was fertilization so low? Uh, I can't answer. It could be anytime fertilization is low, it can be um, from uh, the lab. It could be from the sperm. It could be from the eggs. So it all depends. I mean, um, I've been at other centers where they ended up leaving the eggs for seven hours before they did the ICSI um, just because they were too busy. I mean, that's a disaster. It's never going to be good. So it could be something as simple as delay. It could be something like uh, the sperm quality wasn't as good as you thought it was. Maybe in the process of going through the Zymo, they had such few sperm come out the other side that that was a problem. And that is admittedly what my lab director says, which is why she doesn't like using Zymo for IVF. She says the sperm she got, she tested it ahead of time just on a couple of samples. And she said the sperm quality she got on the other end of it was not good enough to use for IVF. So she said there's no way. She'd much rather just pick the sperm herself. Um, that's what she's saying. So it's possible it was from the Zymo. Uh, there's all sorts of different possibilities. You'd have to talk to the lab that helped you and figure out what it was. They, they can tell you the sperm didn't look great, um, you know, the eggs didn't look great, whatever the problem was. Thanks for answering all of these questions. I learned so much from your live questions. Uh, does endo and adeno affect egg quality? Um, endo does, adeno does not. Um, adeno is endo in the wall of your uterus. It has nothing to do with your eggs. Endometriosis has been shown in multiple studies to impact egg quality. Silence Lovers, uh, who said goodbye, is Silence now saying, lovers. oh, is that hello? I can't remember. Is metformin good to use if your sugar is low? Um, well, metformin technically is not supposed to alter your sugar levels. It's supposed to alter your cellular sensitivity to your body's insulin. Um, so it shouldn't make you go low with your sugars. Um, so uh, it shouldn't affect that. But talk to an endocrinologist for sure. And never take anything without talking to your doctor. Do you have any advice? For someone approaching birth for the first time and having a lot of anxiety about it yeah talk to your obstetrician i mean that's what we're here for i, I still practice obstetrics i spend lots of time telling people about the delivery and what to expect and how to get ready for it and um you know there's all sorts of people that can walk you through it and 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 go over the details and things like that so i think that's totally great I, I want to use the last couple of minutes to, to talk about something. Is that cool? Absolutely cool. So I, I had a, an interesting experience on the weekend um, with a post that I saw where a oh, family, yeah. Oh, yeah. you saw that, eh? Yeah. Where, a, where a family was, was there. promoting the idea that um, it was great that they had waited till 43 weeks of gestation to deliver their baby. And when I pointed out that it was absolutely absurd to do that, I got all these people telling me that, I, with um, now over 20 years of experience and over 10,000 babies delivered, didn't 
understand physiological birth, which I thought was quite humorous. Um, so I thought I'd just kind of touch on this because there's lots of people out there with lots of opinions, but um, unfortunately there's data and then there's conjecture and opinion and all the other stuff. And data comes from rigorous scientific study. So there are now multiple trials demonstrating that induction of labor is safer than delaying the uh, labor for expectant management, which means waiting for it to happen naturally. And there are oodles of studies demonstrating that if you wait past 41 weeks, the rate of stillbirth dramatically increases. Is it a high rate? No, it's one in a thousand, but I wouldn't be comfortable with one in a thousand. That's with me delivering over 10,000 babies. That's 10 dead babies because I didn't induce people in time. So there are tons of people out there. Some of them are now calling themselves birth professionals. There's no such thing as a birth professional. You can be a midwife, you can be a doctor, you can be a doula, um, but you're not a birth professional. If anybody's a birth professional, I guess it would be an obstetrician gynecologist, but, but, or, or a midwife. Um, but there's no I'm such not even a birth professional. Yeah, not even Tark's a birth yeah. professional. But there's no such thing as a birth professional. It's such a misleading term. And I, I find that just egregious, right? So did you study? Are you accredited? Did you get licensed? Um, is there a, an organizational body that actually tells you yes or no, you've passed, you understand what you're talking about, you've been tested rigorously. Um, you know, I didn't get here by not understanding physiology of pregnancy and birth. I actually had to study five years nonstop, um, go sleepless for that same five years, also frequently nonstop, and do nonstop work, and then pass probably one of the hardest exams in the world over two days with both written, multiple choice, short answer, visual stim, and an OSCE setting kind of thing. So I get it, people like the idea that natural is better, the reality is natural is not better when it comes to inducing labor. It's actually safer to be induced. And anyone that wants to argue that, I'm happy to say bring it. I will bring my data. You can bring whatever you want to bring. I offered this to the person, never responded, obviously, because they, they have no data. It's all just, I want to say this so I can get 90,000 followers. And the reality is it's just simply not true or valid or safe. So don't believe everything you see or hear or read on the internet. Even for me, when people ask me stuff, I go and I look it up and I'm not ashamed to say, I clearly don't know everything, no one can. Um, and if I don't know it, I'll go look it up and I'll study it and I'll research it on PubMed where there are scientific articles, not in some book written by you know, a doula or a midwife or even another OB because you're not gonna find the answer in a book. You're gonna find the answer in the scientific literature where it's been rigorously tested, trialed, analyzed. And even then, as we've shown in studies before on the show, you actually need to know how to analyze a study. So I had the great pleasure of working through this with someone I love very dearly last night who needed help um, looking at a specific paper and doing some appraisal of a paper and I spent time going over that paper with that individual because it's complicated. You gotta look for what went right and what went wrong. And there are, are methods to use to assess manuscripts and they don't all pass muster. So um, don't believe everything you read on the internet. Sometimes it's super important to be sure that you are getting the best information possible. Uh, I am being, uh, yes, and people on, on TikTok are now saying uh, 43 weeks. Yes, induction at 39 weeks is safer. It's called the ARRIVE trial. There's also a Swedish trial. So um, I'll happily uh, you know, send you over to this other person's site if you want me to, but uh, literally it was promoting a 43 week delivery, which is just like beyond crazy. I mean, that's probably a 2000% increase in the risk of stillbirth. Like it's completely bonkers. Um, so we definitely recommend induction. Do I give my patients choice? Absolutely. All women deserve choice. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your body, but am I going to advise you on what to do? I sure am. And I'm going to do it based on current scientific knowledge that is up to date and expert in level and grounded in actual manuscripts, not, you know, conjecture because people think that natural is better. 
Have a good night, guys. I'll leave you with that lots of uh, uh, arrived trial. Yeah, uh, I'll leave that with you uh, to leave it nice and controversial. Thank you to the amazing T who is always off camera. My dear friend, I love this guy. You guys have a good night and uh, stay well. Um, and we will see you again next week on Fertility Factor Fiction, where hopefully I will finally pin down the heart to get Dr. Fred Zineku. Have a good night, guys. Take care.